There we go. Try it again. Invite to speak. Yeah, there we go. I'm accepting. Oh, we can hear you. Okay, wow, <laughs> amazing. Thank you. <laughs> All right. It was oh. a uh, off and back on again kind of. Uh, yeah. Kind of. A did you try turning it back all, all off and on and again? What is it like? The, the IT crowd, <laughs> That's exactly right? yeah. what was necessary. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm so happy we, we were able to make this work, Walker. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. Is my level okay? Uh, I could go up or down if you like. I, I oh, could... you're crystal clear to me. But if someone can, uh, okay, can confirm in the channel that we're all, that both of us are, uh, are okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kev. So, uh, well, Walker, uh, as I said, uh, I'm just excited to, to have you uh, with us today. Um, so for those of you who have joined the uh, this channel to tonight, at least for me it's tonight, for some of you it's going to be in the afternoon, even um, around noonish, something like that. Uh, welcome to the Modular Clubhouse where we host at least weekly interviews with people within the Eurorack sphere. My name is Jesper Scherpenhauser. Do not try to pronounce that after I've tried it. Um, even the most well sophisticated Dutch people are challenged by that. So um, what we're going to do, Walker, uh, we're just going to have a friendly little chat. And after a while, we're just going to open it up to the uh, rest of the audience as well to pick your brain as well. And the topic for today is, as always, is Eurorack. So, um, well, as I said... <sighs> It's great having you. Uh, um, I'm so happy uh, you and the rest of the Make Noise crew have been uh, so helpful to me in the last couple of months. So how have you been? How was today? Oh, yeah, today's... Oh, excuse me. Um, <laughs> did you hear the... Yeah, I can, I can hear that, okay. absolutely. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> today's a little it's a little chilly and gray here in, uh, in North Carolina, but mm -hmm. um, we are here at Make Noise. We're, um, we're kind of just ramping up uh, as much as we can to get as many orders out as we can before the before the holidays. So I've been spending most of the day on the production floor building, uh, I was building malts and woggle bugs and doing some calibrations. And so, yeah, that's what I've been up to today. Oh, been a pretty so good, good one so far. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. And then after this, you have other, uh, you, you're back to the production floor or anything else uh, scheduled? <laughs> After after we're after we're done here, I'll probably go back to the production floor and see what's what needs to be doing. I'm hoping I'm hoping that they'll ask me to test some woggle bugs because I haven't done that in a while, and that's a fun that's a fun thing for me to do. So it's one of my one of my favorite tests to do. So yeah, yeah. Well, you just just, just we'll, uh, we'll said see. that we just need to make sure that you uh, you st uh, stick around here for as long as needed until you can just go home afterwards. That's also a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> that's one strategy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what your plans are, of course. No, as mentioned, uh, what I'd just like to uh, get a hold of is uh, who's the person, who is Walker as a person, and how did the whole uh, make noise journey for you come to uh, come to pass? And uh, try to pick your brain, get some understanding, and get some best practices out of you as well. So, at first, could you could you tell me a bit more about how your musical upbringing was? Uh, when we were talking about Little Walker just uh, making his first strides in, in, in music land. Sure, yeah. I was, well, I was always, I mean, I was into music since I was little. Um, I, my my folks, they they listened to music a lot and I was, I, I, I just heard a lot of it. And, um, but I, not that many people in my family are, are actually musicians. I, I think, aside from a couple of younger cousins, I can't really think of, of a lot of musicians in my family, although I know a lot of people are, are really into music, but so I was like a big listener as a kid, but um, but I was one of the first to kind of around who I knew in my family to kind of be interested in, in uh, becoming a musician. And I, I, uh, I, I, I took some piano lessons when I was like really little and then I kind of fell off it because I was too little for it, I think. <laughs> um, but I think around when I was 10 or so, I started uh, getting really like sucked into it in earnest and I picked up a guitar and uh, we got, my family got a piano. My mom was actually playing the piano too at that time. And we kind of were starting to learn together, but I, I, I took to it really quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got, I, I got de decently good at it for, for a kid um, and was pretty serious about it. Um, and 
I guess, well, you know, at the same time, I was like as much of a music listener as I was a player. So mm-hmm. a big, big, big uh, record for me when I was a kid was Are You Experienced by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. My my yeah. dad had a cassette of it, which I'm sure he'd had a, an LP or something earlier. But <laughs> what we had was a cassette um, that I dubbed onto my own copy when I saved some allowance to get a, uh, like a Walkman so I could... So I could listen to my own music. And that was the only tape I had for I don't know, probably six months or something. I listened to it like who knows how many hundreds of times. And uh, I think it kind of hit me specifically with that that album, you know, because I, I don't think that I'd really listened to that much before then where where uh, a lot of non-musical, so, uh, so-called non-musical sounds were really integral to how mm-hmm. the music was being made. You know, he was he was so so into like playing the feedback and and doing the uh whammy dives and all kinds of sound effects and stuff with guitar and i hadn't really heard anything like that before and it was just like really enthralling to me and i wanted to do that um Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah so i i uh i i think i i really wanted to play electric guitar having heard hendrix and then like yeah you know by the time i was 10 11 i was it was like the height the height of the the grunge era, you know, I was, mm-hmm, I was yeah. really into like heavy, heavy rock music, um, Soundgarden and all, all that Nirvana and all that. And, uh, I think I really wanted to, I really wanted to play distorted guitar. That was what I wanted. Um, and my mom basically said, well, you, we, you can, you can get a guitar if you take piano lessons for a year first. Cause oh, wow. <laughs> on the, on the idea being like piano is maybe a better, um, an easier way to get a foundation in, in music theory that could, that could, uh, kind of be a springboard to whatever instrument. Um, yeah, and then both of I you think, started then, both both you and your mother at the same time or? Uh, you know, I mean, I know that we were both kind of in a, in a beginner spot. She maybe had played some when she was younger, but not much or something yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, she didn't, I mean, I think she was also, she was pretty busy, you know, she worked and uh, had three kids and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I had more time to practice and I got really into it and I, I kind of, uh, I went, farther than she she didn't end up uh pursuing it super seriously but um but yeah luckily i did and i was always encouraged you know by my by my folks they were always the type of the type of parents who whatever it was that i took an interest in they'd find a way for me to to have some kind of training in it and actually be able to pursue it so uh music was the the thing that kind of eventually became my main interest and so um you know having having their support was was awesome and um and yeah, so I, I that was my musical start was with mm-hmm. with those yeah. instruments. Although although pretty pretty quick, I was messing with sound and stuff as well. I mean, I was always into recording stuff into my into re- cassette recorders and trying to trying to make it play back at the wrong speed and you know things like that. I we had a a kind of um, junky early Windows computer that had some sound sound recording apps on it you know you can yeah. record in and then and then do things like change the sample rate and uh i i could i found things that would let me drag and drop different pieces of audio and i'd make sort of collages with them and stuff like that and i didn't think of it as a musical pursuit necessarily i don't know what i was thinking of it as i was just it was just fun to do i just yeah. thought got it got a kick out of messing with sound in that way and yeah. just uh, playing it back, back, playing it back, backwards, those kind of things, and and then uh, playing around. I, I, I do seem to remember that you always had the uh, the sound recorder on those earlier uh, Windows machines as well. If you've got a sound card installed, at least. Yeah, we had a microphone that was built in, and I would, I would, I would get my friends, or or my brother, or my cousin, or whoever was around. We would. We would we would sort of record these dialogues into it, or we were just goofing off, and then I'd sort of <laughs> chop them up and change the speeds of different people's voices. So some of us were chipmunks and stuff, and we'd uh, yeah, it just we'd we'd make we just we just goofed off a lot. I'd ha- I, I also had like I figured out that a lot of computer games at the time, you know, they'd have all the sound effects were wave files that were in a that were in a folder somewhere that you could actually access. They would never do that it that way these days, but you could mm-hmm. go into that folder put a different wave files in but with the same name and it would play those sounds instead of the sound <laughs> effects we did that for like every even with like 
games that we didn't even own. You just had like the shareware demos of it. You could go, you could go and put your own sound effects in it, and that was like, that was like what I did for fun, for fun was stuff like that. <laughs> We're just making making our own goofy, like the goofiest possible sound effects for every. Uh, oh, for it's every already sound, it's already sound hacking, game. right? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Love, love that. <laughs> And how did that then evolve into, because there, there, there came a time when you said, okay, well, playing guitar, playing, well, trying to play distorted guitar as well, hacking your way at uh, video games and, and wave files. And how does that then transition into, um, yeah, synthesis in general? How did that happen? Well, I guess, um, I mean, I think that the to me, the, there's it's always been all related for sure. I mean, I also... I also tried things like prepared piano, which was hard to do because we had an upright piano. But um, you know, mm -hmm. I'd, re I'd read about stuff like that, like ways to to mess around with the sound of your acoustic instruments. And I, I had like some junky like kids keyboards, like Casio keyboards and stuff. I'd I started to take them apart and just like see what happened when I pl placed magnets on different <laughs> parts of the circuit boards and stuff like that. <laughs> um usually not much it could get some pitch bending sometimes um but yeah, it's more like circuit bending uh, 101 i think yeah <laughs> yeah probably you know i didn't i didn't have any like frame of reference for what for what i was doing you know i didn't know what i was uh what i was doing or what or that there was something that you could do necessarily it's experimenting um, right yeah just, it's, yeah, it's yeah, your, pretty, your I mean, own definitely. uh it's your own creativity at uh yeah perfect I started to, uh, uh, there were a couple of times where I, I encountered freeware synthesizers on, on the computer too. Like, I don't, I think there was one called synth edit or something like that. Um, just, and they were, they were probably not very great and full featured by the standards that we typically hold synthesizers to now, but, uh, but you know, it would, the idea that you could, uh, you could sort of create these sounds and then shape what the sound was by by changing some numbers or or moving some controls or whatever was was interesting and appealing to me and um and uh well it was really not till i oh i guess also i, I played with rebirth i don't know you, you know that one like it was kind of it was the pre precursor to what's now reason and it was yeah. emulated yeah. emulated like 303s and 808s 909 maybe um to me at the time it's not they all sounded real <laughs> um through my uh bad computer speakers oh, but wow, yeah. um similar kind of thing you know yeah. just being able to turn push change controls and change the sound on the fly all the time it was oh, discovering wow. a knobby synth in the korg ms 2000 when i was uh, just about to graduate from high school mm -hmm. that really was the big sea change because i had never like I'd never seen, I never played a synthesizer that had knobs on it that did all the things I could do with those computer programs. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to be just, I didn't know how any of them worked. I all I'd, I would just play it and turn the knobs and see what happened. And I kind of got a working knowledge of, of how it worked. Um, I bought the floor model at Guitar Center or whatever the equivalent was. Um, and, you know, I had, uh, I think I was 18, just about to graduate high school and I had I had a had been working at a coffee shop for a couple of years and even had somehow managed to save some money. So <laughs> um, it was uh, my my folks went halvesies on it with me for a for like a graduation present. I was about to graduate high school. Wow, yeah. And and I took that with me to college and um, was it was like a, a fun hobby for me in my room for the first year or two to just like make make whatever wacky sounds I could while I was I don't know often uh not sober in various ways but uh <laughs> also when i was you know um and i started playing keys including the the synthesizer in a band for a couple of years in there too and um and still really i mean i wouldn't say that i knew exactly what i was doing really i mean you discover pretty quickly what the cutoff and resonance knobs do but mm -hmm. <laughs> otherwise yeah. like i was i was definitely poking my way through like why do these, I'd go to a preset and try to figure out why it was doing what it did. You know, the step sequence, how is, how's the step sequence are working? What are the, what are these LFOs that are, 
routed these different ways. Um, Absolutely, but you're, you're and, just feeling your way through it. You're you're trying to yeah. well, absorb as much just by trying, and then of course, then you uh, finally you'll get some um, some 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 information from that that you can then use. Uh, but yeah. What were you studying at college? Anything that would have happened to you if you didn't end up where you are right now? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I was, I was, I, I, I majored in philosophy uh, mm -hmm. with, I, I had, I was working towards a minor in psychology, which I dropped uh, actually pretty close to the finish line. It, it, there, it conflicted with a philosophy seminar I wanted to take. And I uh, decided that I'd rather take that seminar than get the, psychology minor because i was kind of done with psychology at that point i was <laughs> i was not really i was not really into it i, I didn't if it, it felt like pseudoscience to me um <laughs> and then you I take know, on no philosophy any... which is a purest form of science of course <laughs> well the way that's kind of i saw it in in a way like that you know i don't know i uh i i definitely didn't i i thought of psychology as some sort of in between area no offense to any psychologists in the audience i've <laughs> I've met some I've met some psychologists over the years who I liked, but uh, <laughs> I I just it wasn't I wasn't interested in pursuing it. Uh, I was you know I was very serious about music from the from the start, but I I didn't um, choose to to major in music in college or even really to to do it that much for classes. I took a couple music classes, but. Um, like the ones that I was the most interested in, they, I, they, I remember that I was able to test myself into the 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 fourth year level music classes because I I had I had picked up enough uh, music theory from mm -hmm. my piano teacher before and just from teaching myself stuff that that I was able to uh, I don't know fake my way in <laughs> <laughs> um, and they let and they let me take the advanced classes but. Uh, and there was even one that was about electronic music. Actually, I took one. Um, they had. I'm not sure what it would be because I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't have much uh, frame of reference for what gear was and stuff. But they had some kind of rack-mounted, uh, like um, rompler thing that that we all had access to with a big mixing board, and they even had like a MIDI guitar and stuff. And um, we did. We I worked with like max msp and that kind of stuff in that mm -hmm. class yeah. um i think it would have been at version three or something like that it's probably like 2003 maybe 2003 um and yeah i didn't understand i didn't really get the appeal of that at that point i was like what i was like because we were using you'd use max to do yeah. things like change octaves on a on a midi keyboard that was playing very basic piano notes and stuff and i kind of I don't know. They didn't. They didn't sell it to me, really. Like why? Why this was so cool. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that could have been something that grabbed me at some point back then, but it really didn't. Um, I was. I was wanting to play the synthesizers, and I, I also had got. I got like myself an MPC uh, 2000 XL at some point, just like mm -hmm. doing lots yeah. of samples and beats and stuff. Um, and so, like, yeah, the more, the more, the the way that the way that. Uh, stuff like max was was approaching music i didn't i didn't quite get it yet it wasn't there yeah. yet well max is yeah. of course probably from 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 those approaches the the most technical one i i'm assuming if you were, were, were to have then started with things like um i'm not even sure if that was around back then things like pure data that that's a bit more um hands-on if you ask me that might have made a difference then yeah perhaps this may have been before or pure I don't know when pure data was released I think that uh, but I I know that um I know that I know that it was still in the very like Max had a very bare bones look to it at that time um yeah no, I'm just I'll I'll so. dive into that and see when Oh no I was I was wrong <laughs> I, I just looked it up myself 96 pure pure data was released so I definitely oh, wow. would have had I definitely could have had access to it at that point but but yeah so um so it was really it was after college when I started to become, like, to to start to uh, really dive into learning about synthesizers specifically, and, like, wanting to know everything about synthesizers. That that happened in my twenties. Oh wow! Um, yeah. I, so I, I was kind of like trying to, I mean, first my my thing was I wanted I wanted to try analog synthesizers because the MS two thousand was was digital. It was a uh, it was like mm -hmm. an analog emulation um 
you know, it, it played like analog with, with all yeah. your, your standard waveforms and filters and stuff. It was very much like a subtractive synth, but, and it was knobby like an analog synth, but you could still, you could still hear those, those eight bit or whatever bit resolution mm -hmm. steps on the, on the turn, on the knobs, you know? Yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd slowly turn the cut off and you could hear each individual step. step yeah. Um, yeah. and I, and so like the idea of the analog synth was sort of one of those enthralling things that sounded like, Oh, I got to try that, you know? So yeah. <laughs> I uh, was diving into, uh, trying to get vintage synths and stuff. And I, I don't know, I got, that didn't, that didn't work. I didn't like that very much because well, it meant like sh shipping things at exorbitant cost that might not work when you got them. And, uh, and then I didn't have the know how to like fix or anything. So, um, yeah, no, I poked around that for a little bit and then, um, but was mostly just trying to figure out whatever knowledge I could about what I had. And so it was this was still point, a learning exercise. Still your, this was still your journey until you figured out what, what you actually wanted or. Yeah. I mean, throughout all this, I was, I was like trying to, I was making music with all these things, but I, and I, and I started to get into, I started to discover DAWs and stuff. I had not, I had not taken seriously the idea of using a computer for for recording until until like I was in my mid twenties or so. I'd been trying to do everything on Tascam units mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And uh the idea of the DAW seemed like seemed like fake to me. I was like, you can't use a computer for that kind of stuff. I don't know. Um, it's cheating, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I even thought of it as cheating. I just thought that it like wasn't that it wasn't gonna be good somehow. I'm not really sure. Like I don't I don't think I understood that computers were powerful enough, you know. I don't know. I I I I came, I, when I was a kid, like we were still in the era where like your computer usually wasn't quite good enough to do what you wanted to do with it. You know, um, yeah. we had always, always a computer that couldn't quite run the things that I wanted to run with it. Um, yeah, so we're talking yeah. here, uh, mid to, 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 to late nineties, I'm assuming. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 I graduated from high school in 2001. So, um, yeah, so yeah. So, but yeah, so, so eventually I did discover pro probably via the internet that, that modular synths were not purely a thing of the past and there were still <laughs> companies making them now. And so I, uh, I found my way into starting to build a modular synth, which, which I, which I initially did in 5U, uh, with oh, synthesizers.com. Wow. Yeah. Cause I, 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 yeah, I managed to discover that modular existed, but not that Eurorack existed. <laughs> it did at the time, but it was only, it was still at the time that I was starting there, it was still really only doper and like man, yeah, a couple others. Uh, like so, um, doper and then uh, what was the, uh, the phone? Like the analog, US analog solutions. And, yeah. Um, I mean, probably when I was first starting to build mine, I don't think, I don't think tip top was there yet. Maybe live wire, perhaps plan B. Uh, could have been. I don't know exactly what year they started, I th but uh, but I, I started building my synth in '08. Um, I'm pretty sure, and uh, it was I within a couple of years. I was starting to feel like I wasn't going to have room to keep to like make it any bigger, and that it wasn't really that much more like powerful or or mm -hmm. uh, or whatever than than like the the Moog, the modern Moog synths that I yeah. had. And I, um, and then at some point I saw a photo in wire magazine of, uh, Robert Lowe, Robert Ike, Aubrey Lowe, mm -hmm. um, who, who I've since, uh, gotten to know and become friends with. And, uh, but at that time he, it was a photo of him sitting there with his uh six U Euro rack case and I looked at it and I said, What the heck? Like <laughs> that thing that that looks like it's got more modules in <laughs> in his little suitcase than I have in this thing that's taking up an entire desk and that I don't know like that I can't move anywhere. So I so I like scour scoured the internet to figure out what what that was, discovered the Euro rack format and around that by this time there was more stuff. There were more companies. Uh yeah. So now we're like, still talking about two, uh, late aughts, uh, uh, 2008, 20, 2009. 2010, 2010 okay, yeah. or, or 11. Yeah, somewhere in there. Um, I, I, I switched pretty quickly from, I, I switched pretty quickly into like being fully Eurorack. 
And, and then I found that, you know, on, on websites and forums and stuff, there were people doing trading of all these things. So trading and selling of, of used of everything. So I just started like trading stuff out constantly. Uh, every, any, any doper module I saw somebody had for sale, I bought, um, cause they okay. were cheap and there was tons of them and, um, and they did all kinds of stuff and, uh, I just was, I just tried everything, anything that, and then I would trade it out. So I, my system went through like, who knows how many different iterations I was just like feeding it in and out, um, making music with it, learning as much as I could. And then, and yeah. then moving on to the next, but still, thing it's still in an exploring mode or did you actually have a, have a, have a plan or a goal, uh, with, with the synthesizers <laughs> back then? I don't know. I mean, my goal was always just to uh, to uh, to make some music that was exciting to me, um, which I which I mean, I and I was I was mostly succeeding in that goal. I listened to some of what I was doing back then now, and I'm kind of like, well, what were you thinking? But that's what that's that's always the uh, that's always the experience, right? <laughs> I think that I think every artist has that feeling if yeah. they look back to a certain age. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it, it surprised myself sometimes. I'll listen to something old and be like, oh, what? How come I can't make music like this anymore? But <laughs> usually it's the other way around. Um, that could be, could be. Well, you might you might look back in uh, in, uh, in maybe in five or ten years and then you think, wow, well, what what I did in 2010 really blew me blew me away. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> it's, it's, a fun, it's fun when you get pleasantly surprised like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And then, of course, but, what the, you said, well, you started off with all these dope for... Uh, modules and how how did then the other um, uh, makers and all the other brands come into play? What what caught your mm -hmm. eye? Could you tell me about it that, wasn't that just, early? Yeah. It yeah, yeah. It certainly wasn't just Doper. I mean, I was also. I guess the reason I mentioned Doper specifically is because yeah. their 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 line of modules covers so much ground. Yeah, it's, absolutely. You could get you you had like six to eight different variations on every single major concept and they were all in very uh, you know um what's the word like they're very c contained that concept is contained in one thing um and so you're gonna get exactly what it says mm -hmm. and know exactly how you're using that thing so if i got a 166 logic module i know that this is this is that now i'm gonna i'm gonna be using and logic or logic exclusive or logic and and figuring out exactly what those things are. So I think that was that that was extremely helpful for me as mm -hmm. as educational as on the educational side. Um, yeah, but I was also um, let's see, I had I had the tip top sequencer, which at the time was the Z8000, and um, that was the first sequencer that I ever had. And it's a pretty weird one for a first sequencer because it's uh, I think if I remember right, all the outputs were zero to ten volts, so it's gigantic output output range um yeah um and it has this sort of nested thing where there are um like four horizontal sequences and four vertical sequences and then also a couple of like fully 16 step sequences they're all working off the exact same grid but of yeah. of knobs but but they're all going all over the place and it was uh it gets hairy pretty quickly but but I, I don't know. I, I dug that, and uh, I got I, I I found a person who was willing to trade me basically all the five U modules I had for their full set of the of the wired modules that Maleco was doing. Oh, so I had the uh, I had I had two envelators and a Borg, one of the Borg. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the. Uh, I can't remember my chronology because a lot of this stuff I had <laughs> multiple times over the years and very and like different things at different times too. But yeah, at some point I had both the Borg filters, the Boogie filter, which was actually my favorite of those, the noise ring, envelators, oscillator, anti oscillator, um, like basically everything that 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 uh, Grant did, that Richter did for the uh, that Maleco ported from. From Grant Richter, and we had, and I had, um, I got the Mega Wave the moment that it first came out. That was that was a big one. That's like the wavetable that was yeah. uh, based on the uh, old the Frack Rack Mini Wave big um, wavetable that doesn't have an oscillator in it. You drive it with your own oscillator. 
um, which leads to a lot of fun because if you change your oscillator's wave shape, then it warps the wavetables in the same in the same kind of manner. Um, and that I don't know. I, I I think that between Dopefer's writing in line and various things that I found that Grant Richter had written about synthesizers, those were the big. Those were big in sort of just opening my mind to how to get really wild and creative with patching yeah that's that's a big that's a big spectrum that you then cover all the way from from dope for a very descriptive mm -hmm. uh utilitarian i would almost say uh, mm -hmm. modules mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong i mean that in the most positive way possible uh, all the way to to the richter uh almost esoteric i might say approach to uh to, to modular so what in, in both of these extremes what what drew you to one and another well i think a, a lot of it is just the fact that it all went together <laughs> you know i could yeah. take i could take some some uh some gate manipulation out of the dope module and get interesting results patching it with uh with the richter's filter or what, whatever it was you know um and the fact that all these each each concept goes into its own spot in the case and then they all manipulate each other and you shake them up and see what happens it's just it was just so much fun <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i felt like i was always constantly encountering new ways to think about it and um, and the way that the way that Grant pr presented these things in terms of how to like different creative ways to use them was 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 very inspiring. I think just the way that he thought about it, even more and above than the than the actual things themselves that he was talking about, his mm -hmm. approach stuck with me, and I've I think I've carried a lot of it into <laughs> into what I do too. Yeah, absolutely. So how how did that then influence your your actual music making as well? So uh, were you still playing in bands at that time, or were you more uh, doing things on your own? Or yeah, I was getting into the 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 kind of zone where I was really making stuff with no audience in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started just just going fully into the into the deepest end of of patching. Yeah, perfect, perfect for for quite a while. Um, and at that and time, yeah, you you were of course uh, graduated from college, so you were. Uh, what were you doing during the day, or was it just purely music at that time? Oh no, I yeah, I had to support myself. So I had a, I mean, I were I worked at restaurants for for most of my twenties, and so mm -hmm. yeah, I would I would be patching like all day, <laughs> um, <laughs> and and late at night. I mean, you know, I did other things too. I hung out hung out with friends and. Did all the things that people do, but um, when you're but I spent a lot of yeah. my a lot of my free time was spent just patching and doing um, you know patching with no goal in mind, just just uh, seeing what happened and the th a thing that I loved about it and uh, and still do is that I felt like whether I achieved any musical goal at any given time or whether I loved or didn't like the patch, I always I always was learning more from each patch and mm -hmm. could carry it with me forward to the next one. You know, I never, I never really got into trying to repeat and recreate the old patches. It was more like they lived on in the new knowledge that I'd gained from them. And I took them into the next. And so that's, really that's still the way I, that's still the way I think of it now. Yeah. Yeah. Still a, a very uh, iterative approach for you personally. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Great. And, and how, how did, how, how did you then end up with make noise? <laughs> <laughs> because if you if you're just doing yeah. the things that you love you make sure that you yeah yeah you earn a living and you just keep on playing and then there comes a time yeah when, well yeah right yeah yeah it's uh i was certainly in a in a, a zone of life where i kind of didn't know what my life goal was was supposed to be <laughs> uh i would have liked to just be able to uh patch synthesizers all day long and, and not have to worry and not have to worry about anything else. Um, uh, it's not usually the way it works. Um, <laughs> I guess I should preface with that, that whole question with saying that, that make noise, I didn't, I didn't bring up make noise specifically before cause I figured we'd get to it, but make noise was, yeah. was also a big part of, of, uh, of that early knowledge on yeah, modular course, yeah. for me, you know, the, 
the the way that that maths and Vadi mix especially um those the approach that tony got across in the manuals for those modules yeah. was was similar to what grant had going on i i really felt like i was i was looking at this these ways of manipulating sound and and uh and like musical form that were useful as an end in themselves and also just like taking it to extremes of malleability that I had never imagined before. And the way that you build up comp all kinds of complex, crazy stuff from little simple components. And it was all, uh, that was a huge, a huge part of, of what, of what was going into my thought process at the time as well. Um, it by pure coincidence, um, I live, I lived in the town that make noise was in and but i didn't know so i oh. was uh i was probably using make noise modules for like three years um i had maths modumix pressure points woggle bug optomix i pulled a bunch of them i got right when they came out to oh, optomix wow. and phonogene i like i like pre-ordered those from analog haven <laughs> got them the moment that they were i, I mean yeah i could have i could have in theory like gone and bought them direct from the shop you know 15 minutes from my house instead i was ordering them from to be shipped from california yeah, but if you if, if you if for this, yeah but if uh, for the same uh, reason they could have been located in, in italy or right here in the <laughs> netherlands uh yeah of course it, that, that it doesn't come to mind oh let me let me look up where where they're located of course yeah yeah, so um so I had a uh I was at I was at a street fair in downtown Asheville one summer and there Moog is also located here so yeah. I knew about Moog um and I had sort of attempted to apply for jobs there a couple times but I didn't I didn't know, I didn't know like how to how to approach that and I never I never got a call back for them but uh I uh, I was going to the Moog Foundation display that was at this street fair, mm -hmm. and I was talking to somebody who was at the Moog Foundation, and I was I was playing the Voyager, which is it the Voyager? Yeah, the that's yeah yeah the Voyager, which was the mini Moog model that they had at the time, and uh, and I think the person at the foundation could tell from hearing me play that I knew what I was doing. So they, oh nice, they were asking me questions, and I said, uh, and I said, yeah, I'm into this, but I'm mostly into modular synthesizers. And they said, <laughs> um, oh well, you should come, you should come back this afternoon because Tony from Make Noise is going to be here doing a demo. And I said, I will be there because <laughs> <laughs> I. I mean, I, I knew who Tony was already. I'd seen him in videos from the Nam show and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, and but I, you know, I didn't know that he was in Asheville. Um, so I came back that day, and he was indeed giving a demo. And I talked to him for a while, and yeah, at that time, uh, I mean, I bet there were fewer than ten people in this town playing modular since. Oh wow. <laughs> I mean, it was not, it was not a well-known thing yet. Um, yeah, and then and back then we're talking about what year are we talking right now? I think this was yeah, this was uh, 2012, so it's okay, nearly yeah. 10 years ago now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I remember Tony saying, "I didn't even know we had any customers in Asheville." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so oh, that's beautiful. Um, that. That lit me up that he that he he was here doing this this thing and um, I began to come up with excuses to drop by the shop. Oh, I, hey, can I buy a function or mm -hmm. um, you know things like that? And uh, oh, hey, I saw your Renee had a a white faceplate. Can I? Did you have any extras of those? I. Oh. So I got the Tony swapped out the my Renee's faceplate for a white a white one, which was a special uh, unusual uh, like limited run version of it. Nice, um, but yeah. And then um, at some point, I was just 
I guess I, somehow I was uh, my I was talking to my my sister in law who who was like telling me you know you should try again to apply mm -hmm. for a job at Mo because you're obviously so into synthesizers and I was like yeah maybe I was like but I'm I really would rather work at Make Noise because I actually use their stuff a lot and and then I just said to myself well all right let's do this so I I went and asked if they had anything open and Kelly, mm -hmm. um, she offered me an interview for an internship, which I went and interviewed for and got it. And, um, I don't know whether she had said they were, they had been looking for an intern. I kind of have my doubts whether they were actually looking for an intern. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think she just saw that I was like, really, you know, that I was very enthused and there weren't at that time it wasn't, we didn't, there wasn't that many modular synth people around. Um, yeah. So I, they, I of course, they knew you, it. they, they knew you, they've seen you around, of course. They, yeah, they'd seen me around some by that time. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I started a, an internship working production and, uh, and I, um, did you have any 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 experience in in making or DIYing before you actually started? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I really learning on nope. the job then. Yes, definitely. And there were, and you know, there were some things that were daunting, and mm -hmm. and and uh, kind of scary to me, like testing power supplies and stuff like that. But uh, but uh, but I, I think that. You know, a lot of a lot of what's done on quality control mm -hmm. is is based on your knowledge of how the instrument works in practice, and so um, yeah, I picked that up quickly. And we had uh, at the time this, and this this is wild to think about now, considering the way that we the way that we do things now. But all of our procedures were were um, basically read verbalized to us <laughs> by tony and oh, wow. then written on yeah. a clipboard that had just whoever happened to be taking notes from tony's procedure it was written down there and that was the only documentation of it so it's all about and, the, uh, the oral history of make noise <laughs> and as a yeah and as a uh, i think sort of as a test of me to see what i could what i could do with it mm-hmm they they gave me the task of turning that into a quality control manual that that everybody on the production line would use and awesome. so i i did that i created a format for it and um i created like printed manuals with photos and diagrams and stuff for every for every single module that was made on exactly how to test every single function of it and uh and then oh, that wow. summer, uh, after I'd been there a few months, they offered me a job to be the production manager. Oh, wow. Um, so to to head up the production team, which was something that prior to that, Tony had been doing. He'd been yeah. doing that as well as being the head designer. And it was taking a lot of time for design and engineering off of his table. So they kind of like hired me to split Tony's job in two at the time and so i did that um for several years and the and meanwhile i was also um making videos yeah. which I, I didn't mention that but that's something that i did I, I made my first video for make noise in my free time um, without being asked to do it i just did it as something that i hoped would be uh <laughs> that i hoped would impress them and oh that's and nice. so then they started they started asking me to make more videos and um and then that became a part of my job as well, but was always, uh, you know, second priority. Yeah, so yeah. I think it was, it was probably 2016 when we split my job in half and we, and John was hired, who is the production manager now. And, and I became uh, instrument specialist, which is what, I, which is what my <laughs> title is now. So instruments. Um, worked, I worked it on started the with that gorilla today, marketing approach then. <laughs> I would say if you just say, well, you're just doing, well, you're just recording some videos without being asked and you just put them online, uh, that's guerrilla marketing. And I think that that's, of course, awesome <laughs> if you can just do that. 
Yeah, well, it worked. I guess it worked out. I'm, I'm absolutely. I look yeah. at the videos I made in 2013 and 2014, <clears throat> and they're like almost unwatchably bad to me. But you know, <laughs> that's that's part of it. Yeah, always always progressing. Yeah. Well, and in, in, as I said, in five to ten years, you're going to look back at that and say, "Well, that's that was true, pure Gonzo or something," and you see the art in there. <laughs> That's of course yeah. one of the things, right? Yeah, and that's something that we that's can all. <laughs> and even it's like I, a time yeah. there's a time capsule thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. But even if I look back at the first videos I've done at the start of this year, and if I compare that to what I'm doing right now, there's a <laughs> there's a world of difference. So no, I feel if yeah. you look back to uh, 2013, which is now eight eight years in the past. Oh wow, you've made strides then. <laughs> we did a uh, we in our crew meetings that we have every week usually uh somebody will give some sort of um like someone will share or, or present something from from what they do in their job and uh and i uh i did i did one that was sort of the history of our youtube channel a couple months ago where i played i played my the beginning of my very first video for the people who i work with and Oh, it was, you, go, you got to was, tell me that was that gnarly. was recorded. You yeah. presenting that? Did you record? Oh that? yeah, I wish. No, it wasn't. <laughs> oh, so yeah. sorry to hear that. <laughs> it was. It was. It was funny to just like. I mean, I think everybody was with me. That they've come. It's come a long way. It's it looked. It was looking real rough back then. No, but still, compared to what we if can do now, yeah. Rough. You 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 don't need to. You need to take it positive and then say it wasn't rough. No, it was pure. <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it i mean i think that you know the synths sounded good and we made them we made them sound good and, and we explained what they were doing and that's what was important absolutely oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah. so so how you said well this is something that you do as a team every week so how big is the team nowadays we've got about 15 people working in the building now oh wow Jeez, wow. Well, that will probably make you one of the largest Eurac companies out there today right as far as I know, I don't I don't know how many people work for each company, but um, no, no, I, yeah, didn't. we're certainly we're certainly one of the big one of the biggest ones. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, and we're one of the oldest too. If you look at this, if you look at who else was doing it in two thousand eight, it's not very many who are still here. No, indeed. Then you, uh, the, yeah. uh, Tip Top comes to mind. Of course, Dopefer comes to yeah, mind. Tip -top. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tip Top. Yeah, Dopefer, of course. Yeah, but yeah, and so, but, so for, for... yeah. From from those early years, you working uh, with engineering. What was your most popular sim to work on, or the most popular module to work on? Uh, how do you mean, like the most popular module? To no, the... just for you. Which one did you really enjoy working on back then? Whether oh, it's producing oh. or QAing or. Well, uh, I guess for as far as development goes, a lot of times. Oh. The best ones are not that fun to develop. <laughs> um, like I loved developing the Morphogene while it was coming together and and starting to sound awesome, but I hated uh, certain parts of development where we were just trying to chase down bugs and stuff like that. It's, uh, it can be very it can be very uh, frustrating and tedious to try the same very the same exact thing for 4000 times in a row that's the definition of insanity right yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> that's right that's a good point and um, then, for, was that tr because that was such a very digital module uh, as its core or yes yeah mm -hmm. digital modules are harder to are harder to develop they're there's there's so much besides the hardware that they do and so many variables that uh, can cause them to misbehave in ways mm -hmm. that you didn't expect and that don't necessarily make sense. Um, That's you know, software it, for they you. don't necessarily make intuitive sense, you know. So yeah, it'll, yeah. It, the, the, the conditions, we had these methods for testing the, things where Tony and I both had these had bookmarks of YouTube videos that were just people counting, like the children's videos where they count the numbers from one to 40 or something, you know. And we put each one of those on each splice recording <laughs> in and then like listening to them in various under various conditions and making sure that the right splices are playing, you know, things like that. It was it was uh, it was cool at first and fun to listen to for a minute. And then after four hours of it, you start to go kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, and then if you do that four weeks in a row. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or uh, I think. It was about two years from start to finish to get the morphogene into something that we were selling. So, um, 
Wow. But uh, working on the production line, I've I always loved doing DPOs. So it's just a lot of waveforms to look mm-hmm. at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some fun stuff to listen to with FM sweeps um, and some um, the calibration of of the wave shapes on the final output. It's really satisfying when it when it all clicks perfectly into place and gives you the mm-hmm. most the most beautiful waves. And um, it's got this sort of um, it's a since it's so big and has so much to it, so many. Mm-hmm different sections and so many different uh, internal connections and so many points of calibration. It's kind of like a whole journey just to, just to test it and calibrate yeah. it. And when you, and finish, then it's very it's... responsive, of course, the, the, the moment you touch the, the configuration screw, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna immediately oh. affect the sound. It's going to immediately show up on your uh, oscilloscope. I'm assuming. Yes, definitely. I mean, and a lot of it's very, that's very, there's a lot of very um, fine touches to be made there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you do a hundred of them in a row, you can get it down to a very fast science. And when you get to the end of each one and sign off on it, it's, you get that nice, a nice <laughs> feeling of having, having finished something and sending it out into the world that feels good. It's you get that from any I'm of them, but, yeah. but a, yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, and I get that for many of them, but but something as big as a DPO with as many as many things to do on it is uh, especially mm-hmm. so. I think it's the same. It's similar with the Zero Coast, although I was doing less uh, <clears throat> testing on the production line myself by the time we released the Zero Coast. So I'm not as I'm not quite as uh, like intimately familiar with the test as I was as I am with the DPOs. Yeah. Well, that was but one of my my, kinda... my other questions. Of course, is of course with given the success that the the zero coast and the strega had recently well in the, in the recent years is that something where you see make noise evolving more into more into the desktop site or do you think that that will always be a part of a modular company doing desktop since as well it's i would say it's the latter yeah. um we are we've we, we the desktop since thing is it's important to us because mm-hmm. yeah it's they're a gateway more accessible drug. yeah i mean yeah or even if it's just even if it's not a gateway even if even if it's the last thing you buy from us it's something that more people can have access to it's not as daunting to get um mm-hmm. to get a zero coast as it is to get a big whole synthesizer you know yeah um, and it does a lot of the same stuff and it's uh it, we those things are it's important to us that we have something that a lot of a lot of people are going to want even though we also want to do the the mo- you know the most um synth head stuff that we can do <laughs> as well <laughs> or in the modules um we've done the last releases for two years now we've we haven't released a new module but yeah. um because we did the zero control and then the strega um there are various reasons for that it's not it's not a matter of we're not doing modules anymore it's more like there have been a lot of forces beyond our control. Oh that, yeah, um, that yes, decide we've, we've, how, we've how, got how COVID. We we've got efficiently. the shortages. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm, um, yeah, and I'm assuming that even at your scale, because I've I've been talking to a lot of uh, makers over the course of the last, let's say, uh, twelve months. And everyone has been impacted one way or another. Uh, on the one hand, of course, by COVID directly, uh, where having that, that where they had to have people working from home or something like that, where they didn't have the the production at full capacity. Uh, but on the other hand, also the well, the the, the IC shortages shortages uh, globally, and 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 the other shortages going around as well. So how how have you been impacted as Make Noise in that regard? Uh. <laughs> in a lot of ways i don't yeah. know i it's it's hard i wouldn't i couldn't quantify everything but no 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 but more on a qualitative uh, approach did you uh, did you have to let people work from home uh, from from a qa perspective or oh oh yeah yeah so yeah when, during when the when the pandemic first hit we 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 completely closed for a little while um and people who People who could work from home with their jobs did. Um, yeah. that, w- that included me. Um, we had we had people collecting basically vacation pay for a while uh, who were not able 
who mm-hmm. worked from home um, while we could. Um, and then we had to sort of reopen with a, like a skeleton crew and people like only, only a certain number of people on the floor at a time. And we established, yeah. you know, masking and distancing guidelines in there. And, um, and it, last, I, I think it was in June this year, we, we all came back to work after everybody was vaccinated. Yeah. Um, and, um, but we're still the building is still closed to the public. Nobody comes in except for delivery people to drop drop boxes off and pick them up. Mm-hmm. And otherwise it's only only people who yeah. work here come in. Understandable, so, of course. Yeah. 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 And from a from a um from an IC shortage uh, perspective, has that influenced any of your future plans? Um or have you said okay, we're gonna because it, it, it will I, of course have I, impacted I, I, yeah. I I can't really talk about that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, otherwise yeah. you had to kill Sorry. me, of course, and all of the people here. Yeah, I, I understand. I understand. You know, every uh, yet we uh, we are affected by these things. Yeah. I'll yeah, yeah of course, of course. Mm-hmm. No, I understand that. No, it's, I appreciate it's been uh, it's been difficult to to have to meet demand mm-hmm. the last couple of years um, for for many for many re- both like and that has a lot to do with it as parts parts supply chains and stuff um and i know that's been that's been frustrating for a lot of customers and potential customers Mm -hmm, we've mm -hmm. had a lot of people who ordered systems and have who ordered systems from stores and have been waiting for a really long time for them we are like trying our best to get out everything we can as fast as possible and it's uh and it feels like we're ne- we're never going to catch up, but we're working on it. <laughs> and of course, that that's of course true for the for the whole industry as a whole. And from yeah, from one of the beautiful things that I've I've come to cherish within this community is that everyone is extremely understanding about that as well. well yeah, that's that. People are people are pretty understanding. It's uh, I, I mean, I know I think that everybody. Uh, uh, you pretty much have no choice but to be understanding because that's just the way it is. It's it's not just our industry; it's every no, everything. Indeed, yeah. Anything you anything you anything you want that didn't already exist on a shelf somewhere, like who knows? Yeah, if it's, it's, uh... if it's something if it's something nice that's not that's not a a mass produced uh, you know mm-hmm. throwaway type of product, you're you're there. Everything's affected. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, but is there any chance that you can uh, give us a quick glimpse in what's to come in the future from from make noise or is that everything is uh strictly under uh need to know basis we uh i can't talk about future projects that Ooh. haven't been announced there oh. i can tell you that there are future projects I can, no, and, and, uh, and i think and that that's I'm, probably also a good thing to know of course <laughs> and i'm excited about them okay i can say i i can say that um we we will continue doing um fun analog modules nice um we will continue to work with tom herb on Mm. digital modules and uh we're working on stuff in both those realms at all times but uh that's that's about all i can say oh no 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 but that's i think that that's (laughs) the that's the best teaser we've we've had on this show uh up until now so i do have to apologize (laughs) i've I've been i've been keeping you for way too long and i still haven't um giving you the chance to uh, talk to our audience. But before I do that, I always have uh, two final things before I make it uh, make it open. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, so everyone in the audience start thinking about what kind of questions you have for, uh, for Walker. Um, if you want to profess your undying love to him, uh, feel free to do that as well. If you are unable or unwilling to join us on stage later on, just drop your questions in the companion channel and we'll uh, make sure to read them out loud later on. Now, the um, one of my final questions is always, and uh, as I said, I've been I've been doing since and, and modular, um, yeah, for uh, since January of this year, um, and I'm still learning a lot. Like like you said, well, it's it's still a journey. But what is your biggest piece of advice you would either give yourself uh, back when you were starting? Or if you what you would give to someone who's just starting on their journey as well. You mean uh, advice for 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 using a modular? Well, in general, in general, in general, about 
music synthesis, uh, Eurorack, modular, starting with that, making music. What's the biggest thing you've learned that you would say, if I were to go back in time and talk to myself back then, when I was just graduating uh, high school, this is the thing that I would have told that that boy back then. Hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's a, well, I know that, I mean, I can say that uh, with regard to patching and and mm -hmm. building a system and stuff like that. Um, I I like a maxim that I first heard from Tony and that I've thrown in my own uh, kind of stuff a bunch, which is program your synth with patch cables. And that sounds maybe kind of obvious, but um, mm -hmm. I think it's the, the, the thing I'd get to is that like, it's really not the module that makes what that makes the synth or the or the music or the or the musician it's it's the connections mm -hmm. it's the program and, it's 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 the it's it's yeah. the scripts that you write yeah i like yes, that yes because i think with because i do think that with with the uh, uh smorgasbord of available <laughs> modules that do all kinds of amazing things natively um, it's easy to, to think about, uh, musical goals in terms of kind of a shopping list of like, oh, I wish I could do this sort of thing. And let me find the module that does that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but almost all things are, are, ba are based on certain concepts that you can get to from patching and you get, it's more rewarding in my experience to, uh, patch up as much as you can yourself and focus on the connections than mm -hmm. to let the module uh the individual module do it for you and be the awesome thing do more with what you already have yeah i guess so yeah well that's one of the reasons <laughs> why i love the uh, i love the whole uh math series you guys did on on on, on your channel recently is because you, you just well, you open up the eyes of, of everyone within Eurorack that has a, a maths, which is probably like a one-to-one a -one ratio nowadays, um, <laughs> with all of the crazy things that, that people simply well, probably haven't thought, of, uh, thought about. And that is, of course, one thing that is you, you never stop exploring. That's probably the thing I would like to say there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think math is a good... It's a good kind of microcosm for what I'm saying because yeah. the it's it's um it's known for being something that can do a lot of different things, but a lot of different things that it does aren't things that you pick from a lit from like a list of modes, you know. Mm -hmm. You you make them by patching it in a in a thoughtful way. And so you can move between and through them, the different those different things that it does. Yeah. And it's more about about how you're taking the basic concepts and putting them together than it is about like having a, a mode or um, mm -hmm. you know something that's something that's baked in pr uh, that's pre baked in for you to do a specific thing instead you get there by 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 d putting it together yourself based on what you're trying to do yeah that makes sense absolutely I'm just trying to uh, <laughs> to process that, but yeah, absolutely, no sports on. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, then, of course, well, I've been <laughs> I've been asking your uh, <laughs> everything that I want to know about you for the last hour or so. So I would like to give you the chance if you've got any questions for me, if you <laughs> if you have them, if you want to ask them, and then I'm gonna take give it over to the uh, to the audience. I've, uh, I know. Did you say that you just started uh, using synths? this year yeah i bought my nts1 in january of this year and that was the first synth i ever bought and now you're uh hosting a, a show about it that's uh you must have yeah gotten i'm really into it really fast. I've, yeah. I've, I've really <laughs> gone in gone down the rabbit hole so i started so what actually happened was is i i, I bought the nts1 and then i immediately it, it exploded into all of these other synths and at that time i told myself i'll never go into your app because then I could, I could just, I, I could just declare bankruptcy and be done with it, and, well, of course that that's, I was able to hold on to that for probably like three weeks, and then I said, okay, well, okay, I'm gonna go into Eurorack, but what I then said is, well, 
if I'm going to do that, I'm going to start a channel, a YouTube channel on that too, because I do want to, <laughs> I'd want to document, doc, you document that journey that I'm on, because otherwise I'm just going to spend a lot of money and don't have anything to show for it. But if I if I document it, then maybe others can benefit from that as well. And at that time, we started. Clubhouse was a big thing back then, so I said I'm also going to interview people because I want to learn as much as possible in the shortest amount of time. And well, of course, Clubhouse has been taken over by all these NFT slinging crypto bros or something like that. So uh, I moved it to Discord, but still, yeah, we try to ah, do this okay. uh, the best way uh, possible. And this has been a great learning experience, absolutely. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. Thanks for thanks for doing it. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It's well, it's been it's 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 been my <laughs> it's been my passion for the last year. So yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, so with that being said, well, thanks uh, so much, uh, Walker, uh, for that question as well. So I'm just going to turn it to the audience. Um, for those of you who've been here before, you know, just raise your hand, and I'll, I'm going to get you up on stage. Uh, one by one if you're uh if you can't join on stage but you do have a question or if you do indeed want to profess your undying love to walker uh just use the companion channel so i would say uh have at it in the meantime i'm just going to check the companion channel if there's anything that we missed i've got uh a dex lamp saying aim into that walker it was so cool at the time uh, Malt is easiest to QA by uh, by Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can confirm. <laughs> and Kyle just confirmed that they uh, at Signal Sounds has a, a big restock of uh, uh, make noise modules there as well. So um, those <laughs> yeah. were the comments we've got from in the companion channel. So peace, people. Um, don't be shy. Uh, I can now confirm that Walker doesn't bite. So if you've got any questions, please raise your hand. <laughs> So anything in the meantime, anything special planned for the uh, for the coming weeks? Anything? Um, anything special? We are, uh, your, uh, yeah. Well, well, we're. I think I mentioned at the beginning that we're really buckling down on production right now. So um, yeah, I've. I. I, I think I. I I don't know if I don't know how clear I made it. I don't really work on the production floor all that often yeah. these days. Um. So, so I to to go and be hanging out on the production floor and, and building stuff and testing stuff is is a fun change of pace for me right now but uh we're 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 getting uh as many as much stuff as we can as we can built to ship out before we'll be closed for for a week for the holidays at the end of the month so mm -hmm. um so yeah we're just all hands on deck at the moment <laughs> i can imagine so um from from a from a euro rack but also a a desktop synth approach do you still see that year over year increase in demand so is that something that it has since then well flattened out or is it still exponential uh, i don't really know actually that's not <laughs> the numbers part of it isn't really part of my mm -hmm. job anymore so, yeah yeah of course yeah um yeah i know that we I, it seems to me that we've we've continually done more every year oh wow um, but i I, it's I don't have any any way to <laughs> any way to confirm that with numbers or anything. It's just it's just the way it seems. Yeah, just it's just a good feeling, of course. So we've yeah. got some uh, we've got some questions in the companion channel. So uh, Shacklefort asks for any cool morphogene tips. That's a great one. <laughs> um, sure. I a thing that I really love with morphogene is to and this is simple but it's easy to kind of overlook and that would be to to find with with a with a splay a uh, reel or sound that's got a lot of different parts in it to um to t turn your gene size up a little bit and modulate slide while mm -hmm. heavily heavily attenuated on the on the uh on the cv input yeah. So, like, for example, if <laughs> I've got this down, turn. It's hard for me to tell how whether you can hear my voice when the synth is playing. So, uh, if I've got this sound that sounds kind of like this as it plays all the way through, yeah, I'm not really hearing anything, unfortunately. Were you able to hear that or no? No, no, no. Unfortunately, we didn't hear that. Yeah. 
At least okay, I do. Well, I don't want to mess with the audio <laughs> settings again because uh, I don't want you all to just be totally muted from me again. Uh, that's sorry. I guess I guess you're not going to be able. To, I'm not going to be able to give you the audio. Yeah, example, no worries. No if worries. You, if if you find somewhere right around a uh, right around a transient and and yeah. um, just heavily heavily attenuate your modulator, um, like I always find little magic in there, and then I'll often. Um, then record it into the next splice and have that that recording of that modulation as a new thing that I can then do it to again and then just go farther and farther into the, the quantum of those sounds. And you just keep building with, with you're just building a superposition of, of, of modulation then. Yeah, kind of just like just scattering it into little little tiny bits that are surrounding each other. And then scattering those bits and scattering those bits, kind of like diving farther and down in uh, exponential uh, dim levels of dimension <laughs> or uh, scale, uh, scale from mm -hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller into the the world that's inside the sound. Yeah, I can imagine absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we do have some other questions there too. So and and as I said, I still need to pick up a morphogen and start playing around with that as well. Um, so we do have a question from Kyle. Did you have to discuss doing video and marketing as a full-time job? It can be a big investment in time and money for potentially hard to quantify results. That's a good question actually, Kyle, absolutely, thanks. Um, well, no, I, I not really. I mean, I think it was more that we, the resources that are provided by what I do is uh, something that we thought added value to what we made. So it's not just videos, but also um, manuals and any events mm -hmm. that we do, which usually usually would have me going to and yeah. doing presentations or demo booths and stuff like that. Um, yeah, you did. You did. You did become the the public face of Make Noise, of course. In a lot of ways, you could say that. Yeah, I think. Um, I think that. Um, it. Uh, it sort of became my full time job, mm -hmm. gradually as more and more, other as the company grew and more and more of my, uh, job elements were think became things that I didn't have time to do anymore <laughs> because we had so much. Um, yeah. There were also other things like training uh folks on the production crew and stuff that yeah. that I continued with after after we had a new production manager and um Yeah. And I still yeah, doing the is, they're QA right manuals? that it's, that it's yeah. sorry. It's hard to quantify but um but also it's um I think that we can see it in the goodwill that it generates toward the company over time by that people, our customers appreciate that we provide continuing, you know, um, thoughtful support for things that we've made for a long time. And we, and that we stand by our, by our instruments in a way that uh, keeps, keeps them, but we, we want, we want people to have a relationship with the instrument for, for a really long time. And we yeah. want to present that that's the way we feel about them too. And, um, there, are, it is hard to quantify it. Yeah. But, uh, we, we it's also it's a bit of investment, think, of course, in, as, as you said, that, that goodwill part, that is something you can't quantify, but it is so extremely important. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, I think I'm just kind of lucky that I, those who I work for, agree with that as well, and and thought that that was something worth putting <laughs> resources into. I think also we build the company around the strengths of the people who work here, and I think that they saw they saw that that they liked the way that I was doing that and wanted to facilitate me doing more of it and being able to do it more and better because they they saw the the, the value in it. So. Oh, that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. So I do see that we have a raised hand here f from Noah. So I've just invited Noah on stage. Uh, Noah, the, fl the floor is yours. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Cool. So I actually have a follow-up question to marketing stuff. So um, Make Noise is like kind of seems to be in like a really interesting position as like a 
a modular uh, Eurorack company in that uh, your modules are like kind of a gateway drug for a lot of people. Like I know a lot of people have gotten into modular just because of the morphogene or just because of uh, even like mass and stuff like that. And then especially on the front of like your standalone desktop sense. I mean, I know people have gotten into like music production and synthesis period, um, you know, just uh, based on some of those make noise products because they're, they're so unique. So my question is, um, do you guys do anything on the marketing front in terms of outreach to um, people who maybe aren't in to uh, modular Euro rack already or um, subsequently uh, people who are like just starting music production? Do you, do you guys do any like marketing towards uh, those kinds of groups? Is that something you're looking to do in the future? Is it something you haven't really explored yet? I'm just kind of curious about that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, that's a good one. I think that, um, I mean, I would say that a big, a big focus for us is on, is on getting instruments into the hands of yeah people who might not have access to them. Um, and we've donated lots and lots of stuff to various like organizations and synth libraries and stuff um, for you know, people who we who we like to um, be able to present and show this stuff to people um, who, uh, especially for things that are uh, like organizations that are oriented around teaching music to young people and mm -hmm. aged young people and yeah, people who aren't going to have, ha have previously had the access to the cool tools, you know? So um, that's, that's a big, that's a big um, priority for the company. Um, I, as far as what I do with my um, side of the job, we've, we've also done workshops with, for the zero coast at various mm. events um, where we have, we, we spent actually Kelly and I several months creating um, a, a workshop format for the zero coast for like eight people. We bring eight work, we bring eight zero coast to the event people who've never who've never used a synthesizer sit down with it and we explore the circuits with them for an hour and a half um, and we've got a, like a historical section and sections on each circuit and yeah. they have they get a zine that they can take home with it has a bunch of diagrams and like a discography and stuff and uh that sort of thing has been something that we that we all that we like to do um i, I guess that's that's mostly like things that are targeted to specific people at specific times rather than in the broader like media approach. Sure. Um, I also try to broaden, try, try to make it so that what we're doing in terms of what we publish on channel, on our channels has a lot of different, it can reach a lot of different levels, so to speak. Like I'll do some videos that are real deep dive patch stuff. That's, that's really complex and, and wild for people who have patched for a long time. And I do some stuff that's really not, that really may not even have that much to do with patching it more, may more be like, you know, how do we, how do we think about sound stuff like that? Um, and then we're also, um, really trying to add additional content creators to the channel. Like I've, we've been working on, um, commissioning videos. I've had videos from people like uh, Panic Girl and uh, yeah. Leo Mendez down in Mexico City, who, who's done a really cool video on the philosophy of light and sound and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we're always trying to expand like who, who we can reach and how we can reach them and just be as accessible as possible on as many levels. Sweet. Thanks for answering. That's Thanks for your up. question, yeah. Noah. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the question. Let's see. So then we've got a question from Marche. Are there any, are there modules from other manufacturers coming out that you're excited about manufacturers that you're a fan of generally or sources of inspiration for new stuff? Um, yeah, we, uh, I, I mean, I have, I have a lot of stuff that I've loved over the years. Um, I think I've, I mean, I've mentioned yeah, yeah. Dope, Doper and Wired as being big. I've also loved stuff that 4MS has done over the years. And between those three, I've got a bunch of stuff in my own system that is never going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently, I've been, um, I've been 
kind of uh, kind of into some of the stuff that Jor Analog is doing. Oh yeah. Um, I haven't actually. I've 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 looked at it with interest. I should say I haven't really. I haven't bought any of it because um, I was looking at um, some of the stuff they were showing at uh, at Superbooth or not. At, yeah, yeah, Superbooth this last year um, looked pretty fun. Um, let me think about some. And Yoron is a great guy to oh, I can I can attest to that. <laughs> oh, is that so? Should that be your analog? Am I am I mispronouncing that? Well, it's 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 a well, uh, Yoron. He's he's from Belgium, and they do speak Dutch there. And um, yeah, so it's it's your analog. I think that's the the proper way to pronounce your it. Analog. But I, I'm I'm not I'm not an expert, of course. <laughs> But he's a great guy, sure. and he's he's he is very approachable, and he's always more than willing to help out as well. So I'm always, uh, yeah, I always. It's been so long since we've been to trade shows, and I haven't oh, yeah. checked out people's new stuff for a long time. I would always go to the Bastel booth when we could, because they mm. always did something interesting, and they're they're fun folks too to just hang out with and talk to. Um, uh, yeah, I mean. I'm, I get them. I've been blanking on some other other names, but we certainly, uh, yeah, I certainly get get into a lot of different stuff. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So I do get a compliment for my uh, for my accent. So you're more than welcome. <laughs> um, then uh, we've got a question from Kev um, as a follow up question to the morphogen tips. If you've got any. Uh, um, uh, zero cost or zero control tips or weird or unexpected ways to use them? Well, a thing that I've been doing recently is my, my coworker Meg, Meg Mulhern, who uh, is a really good musician. We've done a couple of uh, workshops and and like online kind of events for for places recently where we where we did some sort of improv sets at the end where we'd use the zero coast as a uh, as like a shared box of voltage that we both pulled from and then we used we used it as kind of a core of both our patches on either side um, and then just saw where we so saw where it went with us so uh, the, the patch the first time of sorts. yeah I mean just or yeah just a just a, a, a way to do a, a performance together as a collaboration instead of a solo performance and have but have something in common between us that we were pulling from and we've typically the the we've done it with uh we'll we'll each have a zero control and a strega and then we'll have the the no coast in the middle and um and it's fun because we come in without anything patched and we just see what happens and where it goes and uh we've done it like three times now and we'll probably be doing it again <laughs> uh, we also have a twitch channel that we just started a couple months ago and we're, we're we aren't doing more streams this this year because we're so uh filled up with production but probably early next year we'll start doing uh, a lot of live streams and stuff oh, again and we'll be doing great. that on there as well let me see so, if i can find the twitch. url because I'm, I'm i want to share that in the companion channel as well uh, twitch. it's twitch.tv slash make noise music i'm pretty sure uh make noise music we're we're still we're still building our following over there i don't know we don't have we don't have as many followers as we do on instagram <laughs> well no worries then uh let's use this discord <laughs> oh, yeah to, please, uh, please come on over yeah <laughs> yeah sure so uh, let me just paste that there i think we've got it there you go <laughs> perfect uh, then we've got a question from <clears throat> Okay, I'm just. I'm gonna butcher your name. Apologies. Takadl um, has working slash playing with synthesizers had an influence on your life as a whole in terms of how you approach things, for example. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of um, the way that um, the way that I've thought about about sound and synthesis with with working with modular synthesizers has to do with that those ideas of um kind of concepts and 
sounds or what have you being built up from from the relations between smaller parts and that yeah that has a that has kind of a, an echo effect into the way i see things the way i the way i think of the world and you know my place in the world and mm -hmm. um it's 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 uh it's 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 been a major way of in th uh influence on the way i kind of orient myself in that way in a lot of on a lot of different levels because um i think it's even if you just use that as sort of a metaphor it's very ap applicable to a lot of a lot of stuff <laughs> but i don't know i don't know how to how mm -hmm. to how to quantify it too much really but um no, you know, no, but i think i think that's uh, that's that, that's an I, I love the question by the way and i think that your um, your answer there is of course that it's all about breaking down bigger things or bigger issues or uh, bigger thoughts into smaller un understandable or quantifiable sub issues or problems or thoughts i think that that is one of the things that modular does bring to the table there yeah and uh and i think that a lot of things that we that we can take for granted about how stuff is constructed if when you when you go down to the lower level of how it's of how things are made you can kind of start to see that everything's made of the same stuff and it's more about how it's arranged mm -hmm. um like i mean i'm thinking about things like genres of music you know it's yeah. it's you, the way that the way that genres are quantified is is around things that um that don't necessarily have uh they're not as like strictly categorical as they're sometimes made to be made to seem <clears throat> We're all made of stardust, you might say. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Absolutely. So then we've got a very long question by uh, Shou Sha Shu. Shou Sha Shu? Something like that. Apologies for butchering your name. Um, I feel like a lot of the questions around working in the industry are centered around kids getting out of school or people with a lot of free time. Uh, they can utilize towards building uh, skills or an internship do you have any tips for people with more professional skills offering help to uh, to module manufacturers and getting into the industry as in not necessarily electronic or electrical engineering skills um, that's that, that's tough because i feel like this this <coughs> industry of modular synths is small enough that there's not really any rules about how mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about how that works you know each each company seems to have its own kind of way of doing things and yeah um and um i know that at, at make noise when we when we hire we when we're there are many times where we're hiring for um, production line type jobs that don't really require much prior experience mm -hmm. um and so we hire based on more based on enthusiasm about music and synthesizers and um and character and yeah. and character and how and how we feel like people click when they meet the crew and stuff like that so it's kind mm -hmm. of abstract it might be more abstract um you know and sometimes we will we will uh hire for things like engineering and uh and mm -hmm. other sales and stuff like that. But, um, and those all have the, the type of more specific experience and education. Yeah. Yeah. Usually we, we prioritize ex experience or knowledge more than formal education, but I think partially because we are headed by a self-taught engineer, but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, regardless, we're always focusing on enthusiasm and, uh, I, uh, like passion for music, I think more than more mm -hmm. than specific uh, other things. So I, I'm sorry. I, I wish that I had a better a better answer for that, a more useful answer. Um, no, but I think I think, I I think, I think yeah. you're spot on because from 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 what I've heard from from other makers as well is that it's always about do what you do best, and if what you do best is um is sales, then there might be a spot with one of the module makers in sales. 
if you are very good at marketing, well, there, there there's always a place for marketing within one of the manufacturers out there. Um, if you're great at X, Y, and Z, and you are a professional there, and yeah, yeah, then then there is there there is always a, a spot somewhere, and then one of the one of the great things I've come to know and love over the course of the last twelve months is that everyone is always willing to have a chat with you or always willing to listen to your thoughts or uh, discuss your plans with you and they might not be the people that they that they can offer you anything in, uh, directly but they're always willing to listen and they're always willing to then well uh, redirect you to someone else or make some introductions it's one big family and that's one of the things i come to uh, truly love and cherish Yeah, there's, it's, uh, I, I mean, I have found it to be a friendly, a friendly industry as, as industries go. Um, yeah. but I think, you know, you've got a wide range of sizes, sizes of companies, you know, yeah, of course, a of company course. That's, that's one person is gonna, it's gonna be looking for something a lot different from a company that's 30 people or something like that. No, no, no. But uh, uh, even, even then, if you say, well, I want to, uh, let's say you want to do sales for, uh, for, for, for modular makers then I would un I would assume that you can then in turn reach out to all these um, these smaller scale makers and say well I want to help you or offer you a service in regards to sales or I want to offer you a service in regards to marketing I want to help you grow your your brand if 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 you're so inclined and people are willing to listen to that they won't be able to actually hire you on a full time basis but they might uh, do something from a freelance perspective. Yeah, and it can, as with any any sort of uh, area, it, c it can never hurt to just try to meet people and get to know people and form Absolutely, relationships. Yeah. That's oh, that's 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 big. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, great, great. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. So we then have we're coming to the end, uh, Walker. I I do apologize for going quite a significant amount of time over. Um, no, I actually didn't have an end time written down, so we're oh, fine. that's always good. Uh, so then, people I've, just keep your keep your questions coming. No oh, apologies. <laughs> at a maximum, I'd have like maybe fifteen more minutes left. Yeah, oh, that's to, great. Before I have to jet. Yeah. Um, question from Kyle: uh, Is Make Noise coming to Super Booth in May of next year? That has that is TBD. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As with most people, we will have to see what uh, what's going to happen on the uh, on the global scale, right? Yeah. Yeah. When when we feel comfortable with that, I am looking forward to it happening. Yeah. 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 Um, question. Oh, sorry, a comment from Kyle uh, Walker is one of the few people who work in your rack who actually gets to use the stuff. That. Could be true. I mean, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of times you are not really using it day to day necessarily. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think I, at least uh, over here with everybody, everybody uses it in some way, uh, but not necessarily for their job always. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'm very lucky. I mean, I using using the sense is a is a is a major part of my job. So uh, so I I have to or more more accurately i get to use the instruments a lot that's, uh, <laughs> which is great, then a great thing of course great yeah. blessing yeah <laughs> indeed indeed um so let's see do we have any follow-up questions then um i think that we are then almost at the end of the questions in the companion channel let me just ask if there's anyone who wants to raise their hand to join us on stage and otherwise i'm just going to ask you for your um for your, la your last piece of wisdom you are uh, able to share with <laughs> us uh, uh, mere mortals listening to your, um, <laughs> hanging by your lips, so to say. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Putting me on the spot. Yeah, um, well, that's that's what this series is all about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I don't... I don't know that I have more. I don't know that I have wisdom that's uh, that's different from what any what any other person is gonna come to on their own. I mean, I've I've always kind of just uh, tried to present how how I see instruments and music from my own perspective, yeah. and it's uh, 
and I, I hope that it that it connects with folks. And I'm glad that uh, that y'all have decided to join us here today. I'm guessing that everybody here is interested in this stuff. That seems pretty likely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're 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 really uh, it's it's always uh, so fun to see what what people are doing with instruments that we make that people post um their music and and videos of them using stuff and other and other fun stuff and i just like it just never gets old to see people using the instruments that we've that we've made and coming up with ways to use them that we never thought of and and just mm -hmm. making fun sounds and music with them it's it's a it's a never-ending thrill so perfect that, yeah. people are interested enough to tune into this kind of thing yeah, perfect, perfect. I, I, I can only imagine the fulfillment you might get from seeing people do great things with your, uh, with your children, so to say. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, definitely. No, but as, as I said, uh, Walker, I want to thank you again for taking your time out of your uh, busy schedule in this busy, well, holiday season, you might say. Um, I will probably reach out in the future to get you back on this show uh, <laughs> at a later time because I've really enjoyed talking to you. And I think that the, the questions that we uh, we got from the audience have been great as well. Um, so, again, thanks so much for joining. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This, is, this has been great. Yeah, I know I'd be happy to come back on someday in the future. Don't hesitate to reach back out. I will, I will, no worries. Uh, and then I want right. to thank everyone who is uh, tuned in live. Um, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for uh, for your questions and the interactions here as well. Um, this has been a presentation of the Modular Clubhouse. Um, this is part, of course, of the overall Discord community that we have, uh, but also of the YouTube channel that you can find at youtube.com slash the Modular Clubhouse. Uh, please make sure to uh, like and subscribe. I will of course, release this recording later on on YouTube. And um, for those of you who are listening to this from a recording, and if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out directly to me at jesper at the modular clubhouse.nl or by leaving a comment below in the comment section. And for now, I want to thank Walker and Make Noise and the audience and everyone who's watching this again. Um, and I hope you will be joining me for our next show, uh, which is on Thursday. And until then, I would say, please, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you then. Cheers. Thanks so much.